Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this UCL Minds Lunch Hour Lecture, the last in the series for this term. We're very pleased to have you all with us today, and I'm delighted to be chairing Saffron's talk on the UCL East platform. I'm Claire Malhewish. I'm director of the UCL Urban Laboratory, which is a platform for cross-disciplinary public-facing urban research and teaching at and beyond UCL. And I've had the pleasure of knowing Saffron almost since I arrived at UCL in 2013 due to our parallel work in Urban Lab and at the Institute for Global Prosperity linked to UCL's plans in East London and the development of our new campus there. We also share the experience of time spent in UCL's Department of Anthropology, me at master's level and Saffron for her doctoral research, though not simultaneously. Saffron is Principal Research Fellow at the IGP and leads its work in East London to redefine prosperity with local communities. She works collaboratively with citizen scientists, community organisations, government policy makers and business decision makers to bring local understandings of prosperity into planning and decision making processes. Her talk presenting insights from this experience is titled what changes when communities define prosperity. It will explore citizen social science as an emerging urban research method for co-producing policy relevant knowledge about pathways to prosperity, translating lived experience into new prosperity metrics and developing new forms of partnership and collaboration for action on place-based prosperity. It will look at how residents were trained to work as citizen social scientists in their neighborhoods and the role they played in a project to redefine what prosperity means to people living in and around the Olympic Park. So Saffron's going to talk for around 30 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion via Slido. So have your questions ready. Information on how to join the Slido is included in the event information that you've received, but in case you didn't receive it, you can go to Slido in your browser and enter the code LHL2, that's slide.do. So I'm delighted to hand over now to Saffron for the lecture. Over to you, Saffron. Uh, thank you very much, Claire, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the UCL East team for the kind um, invitation to join this uh, lunch hour lecture series. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so this afternoon, I'm going to talk um, to the question, what changes uh, when communities define uh, prosperity? Um, as Claire introduced, I'm going to uh, do that by uh, talking about a collaborative research project um, that I've been running at the Institute for Global Prosperity since uh, 2015. Um, so the goal of the project that I'm going to talk about is to change the way policymakers define prosperity and make decisions that affect uh, the prosperity of communities in East London. Um, and the way that the project aims to do that is to uh, create new kinds of knowledge um, and alternative ways of uh, measuring prosperity that reflect the lived experiences and the priorities of communities living in um, and around the Olympic Park. So the project is a large uh, transdisciplinary collaboration. Um, it involves a number of different elements that include research, uh, knowledge co-production uh, with communities, but with other um, local actors too. Uh, training, capacity building, policy-based work, and uh, practical pilots that are driven by the research findings. When I say uh, transdisciplinary collaboration, um, I mean research that involves a wide range of actors outside of the university, um, as well as a team of academic researchers within the UCL team uh, who were from um, a range of different uh, disciplines. So in the case of this work, uh, the Institute for Global Prosperity convenes a, a collaborative partnership called the London Prosperity Board. Um, this is a partnership, as Claire said, that includes um, actors from a range of different sectors. So local London and central government, um, organizations from uh, the private sector and from voluntary sectors, 
and uh, organisations driving the development of new kinds of research um, in East London. So this group has been convened uh, because they all share an interest in prosperity in East London um, and are working through the delivery of public services or investments, employment um, and frontline support for local communities uh, to deliver um, on prosperity. Um, I'm going to say a bit more about how this uh, collaboration works um, as we kind of go through the presentation. Uh, but just to uh, uh, say something about transdisciplinary work, um, I find it useful to draw on Patricia Levy's uh, work on transdisciplinary research uh, because it kind of resonates very much with this kind of work uh, that we're doing in um, East London forging uh, different kinds of collaboration between the university and citizens and communities, university and um, other actors, uh, place-based actors, um, and focusing on work that is responsive to social needs. Um, it's uh, thinking about work that is problem focused and is really about developing new coalitions across spatial and disciplinary boundaries. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is the part of this project that is about uh, citizen social scientists. So talking a little bit about what we mean by citizen social science in East London, the role that the citizen social scientists have played um, in, and continue to play um, in driving this research forward, um, and what we can start to say um, about the impact um, of this work. So just to put uh, this work into context, I wanted to say a few words about the Institute for Global Prosperity um, and why uh, communities having a voice in defining prosperity um, and, and shaping uh, policy responses that are intended to create prosperity uh, represents a, a change in the way that research and policy um, in this area are developed. Uh, the Institute for Global Prosperity, uh, what I will call the IGP from now on for short, um, is part of the Bartlett. Um, and we will be running research and teaching programmes uh, from UCL East uh, too. Um, the Institute's purpose is to rethink what prosperity means uh, uh, with and for people around the globe. Um, and you can see here this quote from the founder and director of the IGP, uh, Professor Henrietta Moore, um, uh, setting out that prosperity isn't just about improving um, GDP. Um, now, since the mid 20th century, rising GDPs become the default measure of societal prosperity, not just in the UK, but globally, uh, based on the idea or based on the theory of trickle down economics, that rising GDP would translate into job growth, increasing household income, rising wealth, and uh, subsequent improvements of quality of uh, sub subsequent improvements in quality um, of life. Um, so critiques of GDP are well rehearsed. We know that uh, rising GDP and rising incomes have decoupled, and we can see in London, other UK cities, globally as well, uh, rising inequalities in income, wealth, housing, health, education, etc. Um, and alongside that growing livelihood um, insecurity. Uh, now, pre-COVID, uh, when this work began, uh, London had the fifth largest economy of any city um, in the world and was growing faster than any other part um, of the UK. Um, again, when we started this work, employment in London was at a record high of 75%. Uh, but alongside that, um, we are all familiar with this, with the research and the evidence and the experiences of um, in work poverty, uh, food insecurity, um, uh, the housing crisis, uh, the crisis in housing affordability um, in London. So pre COVID in work poverty rose by 50% um, in a decade, for example. And we know that double uh, COVID has really doubled down on those inequalities, really bringing them to the fore um, and uh, uh, increasing the kind of pressure on households and local communities. 
So I think what we, our, our work is about uh, recognizing that that uh, definition of prosperity and uh, models of prosperity pre-COVID uh, weren't working um, and that we need different ways of thinking about what prosperity means and uh, designing pathways towards it. Um, the IGP would argue that uh, one of the major challenges facing society then is that we need uh, to develop coherent understandings of what prosperity mean, coherent visions of prosperity that can form the, fit, the basis for future action. And we need to do that work alongside questioning uh, why economic models aren't working um, and what kind of, uh, what we should be expecting from our economies, what kind of economic models we need uh, for the future. Um, so the work that we're doing in East London um, and in other UK cities um, is about creating new kinds of shared knowledge. So recognizing, building on that critique of GDP um, and thinking about the new kinds of shared knowledge that can drive social innovation and real change um, at the local level. Um, and I think it, that matters uh, that matters for a number of different reasons. Um, it matters because the knowledge that is available to policymakers and decision makers uh, shapes how problems are um, identified, uh, shapes the problems that policymakers choose uh, to act on. Um, the kinds of knowledge that we currently have uh, that are driving decisions about prosperity are often technocratic. Um, created and held by a small number of experts um, and specifically when we're thinking about visions of prosperity are understood to uh, mean the same thing um, everywhere. Um, alongside that within these stocks of knowledge um, about uh, within these stocks of policy relevant knowledge uh, metrics and measures play a particularly important part in shaping uh, political and public understandings um, about what is happening in society, what is happening in particular communities, the issues that matter, and therefore the possibilities for um, action. So when it comes to the work that we're doing in, in East London and in with other communities around uh, the globe, what we want to do is um, uh, to bring two kind of important considerations to this question of what kinds of knowledge we need in order to uh, develop fairer and more inclusive um, and more equitable uh, pathways to prosperity. Um, one is to challenge, uh, challenge the dominant notions of prosperity um, and to uh, put forward the suggestion that what it means to live a good life is a socially and culturally specific um, idea, that GDP in a sense has hijacked um, a kind of uh, a long standing philosophical notion of prosperity as a good life, um, and instead has focused too much on material wealth and less on human flourishing. Um, and the second is to think that, uh, to argue that. If we think about knowledge and reframing in these terms, then rethinking prosperity can become an agenda for transformative change because we can bring citizens, we can bring communities um, into uh, the process of articulating their own um, understandings and lived experiences of prosperity and bringing those into dialogue with uh, policymakers, public authorities, and um, businesses. So thinking specifically about shared prosperity and East London and shared prosperity and the Olympic uh, legacy, the starting point for our work in East London um, is the promise of shared prosperity that was made um, as part of the Olympic uh, regeneration legacy program. So you can see this uh, quote here on the, on the screen about closing the gap in prospects and prosperity between people living in the most deprived and wealthiest areas of London within 20 years <clears throat> of the, sorry. <clears throat> within 20 years of the Olympic games. <clears throat> 
Um, and as many of you will know, urban development in and around the, around the Olympic Park is an important um, element, uh, an important uh, part of strategies to drive this transformation uh, with the intention of attracting major new employers um, into the area, investors into East London, uh, creating new neighbourhoods, building new homes, um, creating the new cultural and educational quarter East Bank of which UCL East uh, will be a part. We also know from an extensive uh, body of work focused on regeneration in East London, but also theories of uh, regeneration and urban development more widely, uh, that this particular uh, kind of uh, forms of uh, neoliberal um, urban development uh, deliver quite unequal, uneven distributions of uh, benefit that often the local communities that in uh, uh, the kind of rhetoric of planning policy and rhetoric of regeneration strategies are meant to be the intended beneficiaries um, often experience uh, very different outcomes, dislocation, displacement, um, the loss of uh, jobs, businesses, housing, um, etc. So what we wanted to do in starting this project um, was to uh, was to bridge the gap essentially between um, a kind of ex expert led vision of what shared prosperity um, is um, in East London, uh, with uh, an alternative vision, an alternative understanding, an alternative definition, an alternative set of uh, metrics that reflects uh, the experience of residents and community organisations uh, living in and around the Olympic Park. Um, and understanding through um, in-depth work with citizen scientists what prosperity means to people living in East London in all of its diversity um, and uh, to specifically focus on thinking about what supports um, and what inhibits uh, prosperity uh, to bring those different ideas into uh, dialogue with uh, future planning and future policy making. Um, so just before I talk about the work that we've been doing in East London, I just wanted to uh, say something about citizen science um, as a research practice uh, and how um, uh, to situate the work that IGP is doing um, with citizen social science in East London in relation to what is a very well established uh, research practice and body of work on citizen science. Um, so citizen science projects um, are, I, I imagine, um, for the audience, kind of most well known as the kind of collaborative voluntary projects that um, involve citizens in wildlife surveys and mapping exercises. Um, the definition of citizen science um, is uh, projects that actively involve citizens in scientific research that generates new knowledge and understanding. Um, projects in which citizens can act as contributors or collaborators or as project leaders um, and projects that have a genuine scientific um, outcome. So addressing questions often in the natural sciences um, around informing conservation action, thinking about air pollution and um, ecological impacts. Um, I would say alongside this uh, kind of more public form of citizen science, uh, there's, uh, there's a much broader set of practices. And what you can see here um, on the screen is work by a colleague of ours at UCL, Professor Mickey Hackley, who's co-director of UCL's Extreme Citizen Science uh, Group. So this is a really interesting group at UCL, which is uh, dedicated to developing and using technologies and methodologies that allow communities, um, regardless of their literacy, to engage in uh, scientific uh, methods. But what you can see on the screen here is some really useful work that uh, Miki has done conceptualizing different forms of citizen science. So going from level one, where citizens are crowdsourcing, to uh, citizens becoming more involved in the interpretation of basic data, um, to uh, more participatory 
and then collaborative um, scientific projects. Um, and IGP's work um, is situated in, in the level four collaborative uh, science um, uh, field of uh, activity. So what you can see here um, are some images of some of our citizen social scientists that we've been working with in East London um, since 2015. So I just wanted to say a little bit here about how IGP's approach to citizen science is different uh, from the uh, some of the large scale public uh, um, engagement programs that I just mentioned in regard to the natural um, scientist, uh, the natural sciences. Um, so the way that we work with uh, so citizen social science scientists is um, to focus on um, both social um, research methods and social issues, but also in the research training program and uh, uh, data collection work to bring in um, uh, social theories that are relevant to the neighborhoods and the work that we're doing. So thinking about forms of power, thinking about some of the regeneration literature that I just mentioned, thinking about relevant studies on class um, and using that to uh, kind of frame the kinds of problems that we're jointly developing together, um, as well as thinking, thinking about um, qualitative uh, research methods. Um, so another important difference is that we work uh, with much smaller groups than perhaps some of the larger um, citizen science programs. So we have worked uh, with 20 citizen scientists over two waves of data collection um, and worked along worked together with them on the team, uh, designing, collect, uh, designing research, data collection, interpretation, and then thinking about action on the research uh, findings. So there's a different uh, kind of scale of activity as well as, as different research methods with a focus on really in-depth qualitative uh, work. Um, and I think the last point that I want to make is also about the uh, ownership of um, knowledge. So uh, one of the challenges is that uh, knowledge is not only socially constructed, it's also socially distributed. So what we want to do with the citizen science programs that we're running in East London um, is to build up uh, a knowledge base um, about local priorities and local evidence that can be owned uh, by citizen scientists in the communities. And some of the, the things that we're planning now going forward are about creating new tools and resources to allow local organisations to hold to account uh, um, the public agencies, local authorities, investors who are making decisions that are affecting uh, prosperity in East London. So uh, just to say a few words then about what the citizen social scientists have actually done. Um, so going back to the work which started in 2015, what we wanted to do was to create a rich and in-depth understanding of what prosperity means. Uh, starting with three neighbourhoods in and around the Olympic Park, in Hackney Wick, in Forest Gate in Stratford, <clears throat> and in East Village, uh, which was the Athletes Village in the Olympic Park. Um, and then expanding in 2017 to add uh, two further neighbourhoods, so working then in Bromley by Bow and also Heath and Dagenham. Um, so to develop a really rich understanding of what prosperity means and what the drivers and, and, and uh, obstacles are to prosperity uh, for people living in these neighbourhoods, but specifically with the intention of translating uh, that qu those qualita qualitative insights into different kinds of measures. Uh, so what you can see here is uh, just a very simple representation of the 10 most common themes that emerge from that qualitative work. So the citizen scientists were talking to residents, talking to uh, uh, community groups, talking to ward councillors, et cetera, in those three neighbourhoods and uh, collected over 250 uh, very rich, very in-depth um, uh, accounts of uh, the good life in East London. And what you can see here on the left-hand side uh, is that livelihood security was the most was the most common uh, response to the question, what does prosperity uh, mean to you? 
Um, so, so respondents talk, talked about livelihood security as being critical, but they also defined livelihood security as being about secure work and or income. So thinking in a broad sense about the, the idea that um, a livelihood is based not just on a job or, um, or several jobs in the case of many of the people that we spoke to, um, but it was also about access to genuinely affordable housing. So housing that is affordable in relation to median local incomes rather than in policy terms um, and also having access to critical public services. So there's a different kind of notion of uh, um, an infrastructure or an ecology um, of livelihood security that, that underpins um, prosperity. And then this notion was also uh, strongly linked to quality of life um, uh, and the choices and control that livelihood security then um, offered people in terms of planning for the future, um, participation more broadly in the economic and social life of the city, um, feeling part of the community, um, and in East London in particular, feeling like they were able going to be able to stay in the neighborhood, not wanting to stay in the neighborhood, but being able to stay in the neighborhood. So referring back to some of the processes of dislocation and displacement uh, that I mentioned um, a few moments ago. So the outcome of this first phase of work was to develop um, a conceptual model. So a representation of all of the things that uh, drive and determine prosperity for people in East London um, that could then be used as a framework to develop new um, indicators. And this is what you can see um, here. <clears throat> and I won't go through all of the different indicators, uh, but I just wanted to uh, make a couple of points about both what this tells us about prosperity in East London and what this tells us more broadly about uh, conceptualizing and uh, theorizing prosperity. Um, so that we can see that prosperity, when we look at prosperity as a lived experience rather than as a kind of economic uh, construct, um, it's multi-dimensional. It's much more than about, it's much more than um, having income and uh, wealth. It's about a range of different overlapping and intersecting uh, services and supports and infrastructures in the neighborhood, as well as opportunities and uh, both opportunities for personal development, choice and control, but also opportunities for power, voice and influence over the kinds of decisions and policies um, that affect people. So it's more than GDP, it's more than income. Um, but one of the other things that, that kind of emerged from this really in-depth work of the citizen scientists uh, was what this research told us about prosperity is a multi-scalar concept as well. So it's about different dimensions um, of social and economic and political life, uh, which are overlapping, but it's also multi-scalar in the sense that the things that are uh, the forces that are bearing down on the neighborhood um, are in many ways not issues that can be um, uh, addressed uh, by individuals directly or even by uh, community um, organizations working kind of in concert with <clears throat> agencies locally. Just to give two examples. So two issues that arose repeatedly in this work were about um, uh, very poor quality and insecure work that was linked to the gig economy, for example. So kinds of business practices are being driven by uh, pat different patterns of global um, uh, economics and uh, business practices um, and another set of issues around household security and affordability linked to changes in the political economy of housing um, in the UK. So shift away from social housing, um, issues around <clears throat> strategic regeneration investments and rising uh, land values and uh, the displacement of houses and businesses. Uh, so what this gives us is a different way of thinking about prosperity um, in context that is about both local lived experience, but also the intersection of um, uh, uh, kind of broader policy and economic processes that are taking place at the level of the city, 
regionally and uh, nationally uh, to you. So just very quickly, um, how do citizen-led metrics make a difference? So what you can see on the left here is just one of the quotes from the uh, work by the citizen scientists talking about, uh, I quote, how can we have a prosperous life for everyone, people of all classes? The situation is precarious for people around here. The combination of unaffordable housing, zero hours contracts, portfolio careers, people have no security, jobs are not good quality. And this is a resident of Hackney Wick. Um, he'd lived there for uh, 20 years. And in terms of translating that into um, alternative metrics of prosperity, what this uh, points to is the importance of not just counting employment, but also considering a whole range of issues to do with the quality of work, work-life balance, real household disposable income, so reflecting the actual cost of living um, in East London and uh, feeling secure about the future. So in 2017, uh, we piloted something called the Prosperity Index. So taking the citizen-led research, taking the citizen-led metrics um, and uh, testing, testing these through a household survey, comparing uh, people's kind of self-reported experience of, is of prosperity in the neighbourhoods where we'd started the research, uh, but also expanding to Tower Hamlets and uh, Barking and Dagenham too. Um, and what you can see here is just uh, one domain of the prosperity model um, that I showed earlier, looking at the foundations of prosperity. So the things that people said are absolutely essential for them to build a good life on. Um, and if you look in subdomain two, so I'm pointing now, uh, one of the important new metrics that we developed based on the qualitative research was a different measure of real household disposable income. Um, so one that takes into account uh, a whole range of different, uh, a whole range of different costs. So not just um, uh, tax and uh, housing costs, but also thinking about things like childcare, bills, uh, fuel poverty related issues. Um, so what people in East London said was uh, uh, the kind of uh, cost of living that they actually had to take account of. Um, and also incorporating what you can see here in the subdomain one is a set of indicators around work quality. So livelihood security, are jobs the kind of jobs that people want? Um, are they offering pathways to security in the future? Um, so just to pull out one or two points from, from the research findings from the prosperity index, the pilot prosperity index, uh, what this told us is that um, quality of work in these neighbourhoods is much lower than the London average. Um, so 10% of the households we interviewed in these neighbourhoods were in temporary work. Uh, levels of real household disposable income were very low. Um, so uh, almost 30% of the households that we interviewed had less than 200 pounds a month in disposable income, um, including some households in the Olympic Park, um, in the new neighbourhoods um, in the Olympic Park. Um, you can't see it here on this slide, uh, but we uh, the, the section of the prosperity index that looked at well-being and social connections um, identified that uh, while the neighbourhoods, uh, while the residents involved in the survey reported relatively high levels of well-being, um, actually the qualitative work that sits alongside this um, shows that community social networks were really bearing the burden of insecurity and there was a lot of kind of informal support in the neighbourhood which which after a year of lockdown uh, nobody will be surprised um, to hear about um, but this points to um, an important issue which is which is the nuance of uh, uh, looking at prosperity through the lens of citizen-led um, experience and metrics rather than expert-led so if we were using conventional expert-led well-being metrics, we would see that uh, well-being uh, scores were very high across the five neighbourhoods, but that was disguising or obscuring a whole range of um, issues around security and stress and social and economic um, inclusion. Um, I 
Hey, what changes when communities define prosperity? So I'm, this is my last slide and I just wanted to uh, make a few reflections based on what we've learned about prosperity, um, some of the kind of emerging impacts of the work, uh, what's gonna happen next in terms of the long-term research program and um, uh, what we can reflect on uh, about this kind of transdisciplinary uh, collaborative way of working. Um, so what changes? So I think, um, I hope uh, that you can see how um, a citizen-led process of focusing on prosperity as a lived experience has identified a whole uh, range of um, intersections between different domains of social and economic life that drive prosperity. So it's given us both conceptually and practically for East London, but also theoretically for IGP's work elsewhere, a much broader, multi-dimensional, relational, multi-scalar idea of what, what constitutes prosperity um, and how uh, it's possible to explore both a locally specific, um, uh, locally context specific understanding, but also to take account of the way that uh, uh, kind of city level, regional, national, global forces uh, bear down on and, and create um, conditions in neighbourhoods which can uh, cause obstacles to uh, prosperity. Um, thinking at this kind of very granular level, um, as opposed to having uh, regional or national levels uh, of uh, national data about GDP gives us a much kind of finer grained understanding of the distribution of benefits um, of regeneration. Um, and one of the things I haven't talked about um, is, is wanting to explore uh, the different uh, levels of the different kinds of experiences, um, specifically between um, long-term residents of East London and uh, people who've moved into um, areas of new development, new communities in East London uh, more recently. That's also an important part of the work, but don't have time to talk about that today. Um, so in terms of kind of concrete impacts on policy and practice, um, uh, what we can see emerging from the work that we're doing through the Prosperity Board is uh, we've got a conceptual model uh, which has been translated into prosperity metrics. Um, those uh, new prosperity metrics are being adopted by the boroughs and by partners um, in the other partners in the Prosperity Board uh, being incorporated into policy making and strategy. Um, and last year, the board of the London Legacy Development Corporation adopted the Prosperity Index um, as a legacy impact uh, measurement framework. So that means that going forward, um, we, going forward, uh, we will be running a 10 year longitudinal study um, that looks at using this, this conceptual model and these measures to assess um, and evaluate. Uh, the impacts of the um, uh, Olympic legacy from a, from the perspective of the, the priorities and experiences of uh, local communities. Um, but I just wanted to uh, make maybe two reflections just very quickly before I finish. Um, and one goes back to the comments that Claire made in her lecture at the very beginning of this uh, lecture, spring term lecture series, which is about um, university urbanism and the vision for UCL East to be an engaged um, campus and to work with um, uh, citizens and communities in different ways, thinking about social impact. And I think um, what this long-term transdisciplinary work has shown us is that it is uh, possible to challenge dominant um, narratives and forms of knowledge. We can um, and have established citizen social science as a credible and viable uh, way of working with these partners. Um, but that it then raises a whole set of issues around um, capacity building. And capacity building is often discussed uh, as something uh, that communities need, for example, or, or community organizations need in order to engage with uh, policymakers and stakeholders. But actually what this process has showed, showed us is that um, this new way of working, these new kinds of knowledge require um, cultural shifts and different ways of working across a whole range of institutions. Um, and that, that that kind of process of capacity building is one that needs to uh, take place across this transdisciplinary um, collaboration. 
Um, and I think I will end there because I think we might be running out of time for questions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Saffron. That was a fascinating talk and an insight into your work in East London. Um, and I think it's an incredible achievement that you've managed to get this built into the legacy impact measurement framework and have the opportunity to do this 10 year longitudinal study, which I think is an aspiration that many academic researchers have, but sadly are never able to fulfill due to the lack of funding and, and support outside academia and so on. So that's um, fantastic. Um, and I wanted to just um, kick off the questions. We have a few in Slido, which is great. So thanks everybody. Um, but just by sort of reflecting on the fact that, um, you know, the strategy for the regeneration of East London has been around for many decades. And in a way the Olympics was just sort of one, one, one point in that process and one that nobody had really envisaged in the nineties perhaps. Um, but I think post Olympics and of course with the sort of um, imminent um, winding up of the LLDC and its replacement by the new innovation district, um, we of course are, you know, need to ask lots of questions about, um, you know, what's happened to the original convergence framework that framed the leveling up agenda behind yeah. the Olympics legacy promise. And I just wondered what um, light you feel your research has shed on that um, and um, you know how far it's achieved its aims and of course particularly in light of COVID-19 which came as a complete curveball really in this whole scenario one that nobody ant anticipated even though we probably should have um, and all of the questions that that has um, really highlighted around inequalities health inequalities income inequalities inequality of opportunity and also um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, issues around low participation in various kinds of um, formal processes amongst which we can, you know, perhaps position ourselves as academic researchers. So it'd be great to just have a few thoughts on that looking back a bit. Yeah, um, thank you. So um, I think a few things to say about how this work sits in relation to the convergence framework. Um, first of all, so um, when we began this work initially in 2015 with the LRDC as the first partner, the intention was to um, uh, to explore what a citizen led set of um, alternative metrics could offer to uh, the convergence framework. So the convergence framework in, in many ways is a very conventional set of uh, um, indicators, uh, things that are collected around educational attainment, job growth, uh, feelings of safety. So what we wanted to do with this work was to, um, to ask without an agenda uh, what prosperity means in order to identify what other kinds of metrics could be um, uh, considered kind of alongside the convergence, the convergence framework. Um, and I think um, the point about the winding up of the LLDC is important for the future of the work that I've just talked about. So one of the things that, that has been really important is to establish, a, a, uh, establish and embed these ways of working um, in lots of different organisations and institutions. And um, although we haven't done an enormous amount of it yet to make sure that, that research going forward can be properly disseminated and distributed and owned by different uh, uh, partners in the community to make sure that holding to account um, can uh, continue to take place. But I think in terms of, of the promises, I suppose, of the convergence uh, framework, I think um, uh, affordable housing is one of the issues that I've looked at most closely um, in relation to uh, this work with, with partners in East London. And I think, uh, you know, the promise that housing in the Olympic Park would be uh, for local families and um, affordable in local terms um, is one area of that promise that, that you know, has not been delivered. Um, and I think much more innovation is needed to come up with different kinds of models. But also I think what, um, what these kinds of alternative measures can offer us is a way of understanding, uh, is a way of understanding how 
issues and services like housing and employment and um, intersect with each other. Um, because what we tend to see is, is uh, housing in one policy silo and uh, employment and skills and training in another policy silo. But when we think about how those intersect in everyday life, we can see that actually they're, they're overlapping issues in terms of livelihood security. Um, um, I hope that makes sense. And I, and I think, you know, we could see that, as I said, many of these issues pre-COVID with regard to health inequalities, access to opportunities uh, were already long-term and well-established um, and well-known about in East London. And I think, you know, COVID has only, only increased that pressure. Great, thanks, Saffron. And I think um, in relation to this question of participation um, and, you know, you know, potential reluctance around participation, there are a couple of questions here um, which um, connect to that. So um, firstly, regarding decision making, how can we balance the power dynamics between citizens as researchers or social scientists and policymakers or people at the top? Um, I think that's a really in, that's a really important question, and I think uh, it speaks to um, some of the other parts of the work that the London Prosperity Board is doing, which are not necessarily research related, but are thinking about experimenting with different kinds of uh, governance. So, for example, um, one of the uh, one of the things that we will be doing over the next few years is running a new research program, which is about uh, citizen participation in economic and innovation policy making. So trying to identify a whole new range of uh, participation mechanisms and governance frameworks and opportunities for engagement that can bring uh, citizens directly into, into areas of influence and decision making that haven't, um, that are less, uh, that are, are not so often opened up to citizen participation. So thinking specifically about economic and innovation policy, for example. And I think I, I would really question in some ways the idea that there is a kind of reluctance uh, uh, with regard to participation in East London. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge just how much is going on and how much is done by, by um, residents and by local community organizations and how the work that I've talked about today builds on an enormously long history of research that is done by communities, for communities, about communities in East London. So this in no way is, uh, uh, so while the methods we're using um, might be slightly different, this is in no way a new um, uh, kind of form of engagement in um, East London. And I would say that if, if there's any reluctance around participation, it often comes back to the question about uh, whether opportunities to participate are felt to be meaningful. Um, so uh, are the invitations to participate um, the decisions that, that are really affecting uh, people's day-to-day -day lives? Um, so can they talk about livelihood security? What difference can be made in terms of opening up opportunities? Um, or, or are they more about uh, uh, issues which are to do with planning and uh, spatial development um, in the neighbourhood. Thanks, Saffron. So quite a dynamic grassroots landscape, in fact, in East London. Um, I think that relates to two further questions. So one from Dominic Murphy, which um, says your work in East London and Camden has really whet the appetite for more citizens to become citizen social scientists. And so then how can we create more access um, for more citizens to do that. Um, but then also at the same time, um, another question, redefining prosperity in a multicultural environment, how in redefining prosperity in a multicultural environment, how can researchers ensure that culture and ethnicity aspects and needs of citizens are taken into account? So how do we balance those two things? Um, and I'm just going to start with that last question uh, because um, because it's an, an enormously important issue and something that I haven't really had an opportunity uh, to talk about today because of time. 
uh, but some of the work that uh, uh, the IGP research team has been looking, doing over the last few months is looking specifically at um, prosperity through, uh, prosperity in relation to um, ethnic differences, uh, for example. So just taking some of the pilot data from 2017 and looking at it through an ethnicity lens um, to then identify what we need to do and what other issues we might need to take into consideration for um, the next wave of, wave of data collection. Um, and I think uh, we haven't really so far had the opportunity to look at different kind of cultural um, imaginaries and visions um, of prosperity. Uh, but I think it, it, it's a really important area and um, you know, it should be an area of work um, in its own right. Um, and it's something I very much like to do. Um, especially, uh, yeah, thinking about different kind of imaginaries um, and then a kind of cross-cultural comparison, but we just haven't been able to do it yet. That sounds um, fantastic, yeah. Um, and Dom's uh, question, um, yeah, uh, one of the things I talked about at the beginning of the presentation was around the kind of um, uh, knowledge infrastructure that is required to deliver this kind of work. Um, and uh, citizen social sciences is, is about uh, both challenging kind of dominant policy narratives, but also the idea of what kinds of knowledge universities produce um, and the way I think that training and um, education um, are delivered, can be delivered. Uh, so one of the really exciting pieces of work that's emerged from um, this collaboration is thinking about the idea of citizen social science um, academies, citizen social science uh, summer schools, um, and a process of um, working very, very closely with voluntary and community sector partners in East London to um, uh, support them, train them, enable them to um, uh, uh, kind of resource and recruit and train their own citizen social science uh, scientists who can then engage in this kind of work and who can train others and you know expand and increase the number of citizen scientists uh, that are working in the area and that's an issue about both um, creating increasing the number of citizen scientists but also the capacity of organizations and institutions to then work with them in ethical and uh, uh, kind of appropriate ways so it's not just about training uh, residents, it's about the kind of culture change and the infrastructure that's needed to support organizations to work differently too. It hasn't quite answered Dom's question, I don't think. But. Maybe something to continue after this uh, talk. Um, there's another question that relates specifically to UCL, which um, I think came up in my uh, talk as well in January and obviously is a subject of great interest to us all in the UCL community but do you think that UCL can create an, a community feel in East London or will it feel like big business taking over the East? That's a really huge question <laughs> and, <laughs> and as someone who's not not uh, formally part of UCL East, I don't know how well qualified I am to answer it, but however, I can kind of reflect on what uh, people say to me um, as, uh, you know, residents kind of looking in on the process. Um, and I think, um, so I think there's a number of different issues and one of them is about really thinking through what a civic university or what a university can do to have a meaningful impact on um, regeneration. Um, and that's not just about, so it's, it's definitely about community engagement and participation and a meaningful, meaningful infrastructures for voice and influence. And it's definitely about uh, opening up pathways to education um, but it also has to be about the way the organ, the university as an institution uh, works more broadly. So what are its employment practices, for example, and how do those employment practices um, impact on things like the secure livelihoods example I was discussing today? Um, uh, what can the university be doing to um, uh, speak to some of the concerns around meaningful 
um, uh, housing of affordable housing that is meaningful in local terms, for example, where are the different kind of parts and practices within the institution as a whole that are not just about community um, participation in programming or use of space. Um, I don't know if that's answered the question, but I think it's more my from my point of view, um, it's got to be that kind of holistic uh, thinking about um, the impact of the institution beyond conventional metrics of how many local students are we going to attract um, into education. Yeah, thanks, Saffron. And I think it's interesting to, um, you know, to reflect on the fact that UCL is in, in the London borough of Camden, UCL is the second largest employer. Um, so thinking about the responsibilities of big employers in local areas, how do we translate that to the um, East context? Um, and also remembering that UCL as an institution is not one um, homogenized uh, sort of, yeah, homogenized entity, but is made up of many, many different parts, all of which are doing different things, uh, sometimes in coordination with each other and some sometimes not. Um, so it's quite a sort of complex picture that one needs to um, engage with. Um, so thank you very much, Saffron. I don't think we have any more questions on the Slido. I mean, I wonder if I could just sort of conclude with a, a sort of quick but big one about you know, how thinking of UCL and thinking about how UCL positions itself as London's global university, how can we extrapolate from the local to the global in, in the research that you've been doing? And I was thinking particularly, um, you know, in terms of the way that this is framed as a prosperity index in relation to SDG 11 and uh, UN Habitat City Prosperity Index. So, is there a relationship between them um, or, you know, and is this uh, data and insights that you um, hope to feed back into this international policy framework and rethinking um, prosperity at a global level? Um, yeah, so I think um, what we have learned, uh, what we have learned from this work in East London um, is about the approach and the methods, I think. So what we what we can see here is that there is a there is a process which can be translated uh, to many different locations um, and situations. Um, and the IGP is uh, working, for example, in Kenya and in Tanzania and um, in Lebanon, among other places, um, applying the principles of working in this way, as opposed to applying a specific set of metrics um, and a specific prosperity framework. Um, and I think um, the City Prosperity Index and, and our work do quite different things and they operate at different scales. But I think the fundamental difference between them um, is that the work that we are trying to do is built from the bottom up um, and is about understanding prosperity in a particular context at a particular time um, from the perspective of uh, certain groups, as opposed to applying a citywide framework um, across every city and using aggregate data to do that. So I think the local, we can um, theorize, uh, uh, we can theorize prosperity globally from very specific um, experiences um, and very specific contexts, I think. So that some of the things I pointed out earlier about not only the multidimensional nature of prosperity, but the kind of relational notion of prosperity, thinking about uh, thinking about it as multi-scalar and in relation to political um, economy, um, work that we're doing elsewhere is looking at uh, kind of space and time. So the temporal dimensions of prosperity and decisions that people make um, in the present that are, uh, you know, perhaps trade-offs um, against uh, future uh, prosperity and living well. So it's, there's, there's a lot of very compl complex kind of nuanced um, conceptual insights emerging from locally specific work that I think um, speak to um, speak to the way that prosperity is conceptualized generally in the SDGs, uh, which is about prosperous and fulfilling lives as an aspiration. Um, but but if you look at the way that prosperity is then uh, operationalized as an indicator and the way it's reported on. Um, 
uh, by the UN. Um, it's only in relation to a very narrow uh, um, idea of prosperity as um, shared prosperity as an increase in income for the poorest 40%. So the rhetoric of, of prosperity in the SDGs is, is a very long way from the way that it's actually being measured um, and reported on, which is essentially uh, using a kind of pro-growth, um, pro, uh, a pro-growth kind of poverty reduction um, measure. Great. Thank you, Saffron. That's really interesting and lots to fo follow up on there. Um, so I think, yeah, it's two o'clock. We should uh, draw this session to a close. Thank you everybody for joining. And if you want to find out more about Saffron's work, just check out the IGP website. Thank you, Saffron, very much for um, your contribution to the series. Um, and um, do check out next term's programme on the UCL Minds webpage. There'll be um, new interesting lectures coming up after the Easter break. And in the meantime, everybody do keep well and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.